We sing your praises for you. You invite us to worship you. And we just say we want more of you. You're all that we need, God. Nothing else matters, Father. You are my desire, Lord. is found. 
worship you, oh God. the Lord say that there is a roar in the atmosphere. There's a sound that has to be released in this atmosphere. As we have stepped out of 2014 and we're stepping into 2015, we can just go into this year thinking that business as usual. But the Lord is saying to us that we cannot go into 2015 expecting what fail does, but we're going into this year with the roar expecting that great place corporately in the atmosphere in the nation in the body of Christ. there is a brokenness that he wants to bring to a closure and a healing and we are the people that can move forward say here i am lord use me and release that sound into the atmosphere because in that sound when we release that sound there's a breaking that takes place there's a breaking that takes and then he is the one that pours out. He will be the one that conquers. He will be the one that brings the victory. He's the one that brings the complete 360. Hallelujah. I tell you, this morning, as we've declared that our soul is well this morning, there's a couple of things. I, I just feel like, it, does anybody have shoulder pain on their right shoulder, on their back, close to that? All right, right there. Anybody else? The other one is the left wrist. Does anybody have a left wrist ache, anything, maybe legacy? All right, okay. Here we go. This morning, as we're praying for our soul to be well, let's pray for our body to be well. This morning, I tell you what, what the enemy has meant for bad, we're going to pray right now. We're going to declare healing right now. So right here, uh, Pastor Ray, if a couple people can gather right there. Yep, yep. Let's get it on that right shoulder and left wrist. And can we come into agreement, have some corporate anointing this morning, and believe for God to heal right now? Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I command every sickness, disease, and pain, and ailment would leave these bodies right now in the name of Jesus. I declare that they are healed all right now, Father. Father, we put our faith in you, and we believe knowing right now that this pain will be gone right now in the name of Jesus, and it will not return. Right now in the name of Jesus, right now in the name of Jesus, we declare it and we say that it is so. Right in the name of Jesus. Can you move your wrist and move your arm around? Is, the, is it feeling better? It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. On. Okay. Hallelujah. I tell you what, God is still in the miracle business. I tell you, just as we've declared it as well with our soul, you can declare that over your body. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Just give him a hand clap of praise this morning.
thing is, is uh, you know, Pastor Shirley's going to talk about this year and, and the declaration of this year. But, you know, I, I hear the sound of this year and the battle cry of this year and it and it's not the roars and the and the and the blasts and things like that although there may be times for that this year but I'm reminded of a 7-Up commercial, you know, with all the Coca-Cola jingles and the Pepsi jingles, 7-Up was kind of standing alone on its own out there and had to pay for everything itself and just kind of its own entity, the Uncola kind of thing. And their commercial didn't have a jingle. It didn't have anything in it. All it was is the guy opening up the can, and you could hear it go, and he would drink it, and you could hear him gulping, and at the end of it, and that's the sound, that's the war cry this year was, the enemy can do whatever he wants, and we're just going to sit back in a lawn chair with our feet up, and we're going to go, <sighs> and we're going to take our refreshing beverage, which is the anointing of the Lord, and we're going to drink it, which is our meat and our sustenance, and we're going to sit back and relax and not worry because knowing that angels are being dispatched upon our behalf. Smith Wigglesworth was sitting in his room in bed asleep, and Satan himself walked up in his room. And it, Smith Wigglesworth could sense something in the room. He kind of rolled over out of the corner of his eye, you know, with one eye open, how we do in the morning, and looked up and said, oh, it's just you. And he rolled back over and closed his eyes. Now, that's what I'm talking about. That's the kind of peace that's coming here. That's the battle cry of the year is... Boy, I'm telling you what, it makes nobody more upset than when you're doing and you're exerting virtually no effort and still defeating them. Boy, it's like not you're not even using your brain or your effort or your muscles or anything and you're still beating them. It's like walking up with one arm behind your back, closing your eyes and your feet tied together and you're still beating them up. There's nothing more frustrating to an enemy than that. And that's why this season that war cries, can you just do it with me? Hallelujah. You believe that? Amen. You may be seated this morning. I bless you. I bless you. Anybody go to Growth Track this morning? Growth Track, Growth Track, Growth Track. That is awesome. I'm telling you what, Growth Track is, the, is one of the best things since sliced bread, in my opinion, because it, you have 30 days. 30 days, you'll know if you like us or not, and 30 days will let us know if we want to keep you or not. It, it's in 30 days. I mean, you can't get, but most people go to a church of years, you know, and that's like that third year somebody says something. Well, I didn't know we believed that here. I'm not going here anymore. <laughs> Find out in 30 days. Everything. Ask all the questions, sit in all the classes, and you're like, yeah, yeah, I don't think this is for me. 30 days. You know, have a great trip, but God bless you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But in 30 days, it's so simple. So if you would, if those of you who haven't participated, and even if you've been here for years, I find it so valuable. Over the summer, we got to uh, set up a church in Olean, uh, Epic Olean, and we were able to train up and, and, and set up and implement the growth track there. And I, I got to teach it several times, and it just reminded me of what Epic Church stands for, and it's just so great. It's just so awesome, and it brought those core values back to my heart and, you know, really just aligned me back with the presence of the Lord and the path and purpose that He has for me. So if you would, make an effort to attend that. And if you haven't attended for a while, it's okay. You can go back and just recall those things in those classes. It'll be fun, I promise. Amen? Mr. Ken Kelso, where are you, sir? Oh, you've got an iPad. Is that an iPad? Oh. It's a no. It's a no pad. <laughs> it's a Samsung. <laughs> That's right. Tell me. All right. <clears throat> tithing offering time. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to talk about tithing, and we've taught this before, but Pastor Michael said let's refresh us on this and talk about this a little bit. So. Is it Old Covenant or is it New Covenant? And truly understand tithing, we've got to go back to Abraham because he was the first person mentioned in the Bible that tithed. He tithed to a fellow by the name of Melchizedek. And you can find him out in uh, more about him in the book of Hebrews. But uh, it's in Genesis. And so we know that in Romans 4, Paul tells us that everything that Abraham did... Um, he did by faith and that Abraham was justified by faith and not by the law. 
And it's because the law hadn't come into being yet. God had not given the law when Abraham was there. In Romans 4, 3, Paul quotes Genesis 15, 6. He says, when he writes, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham didn't do something. He believed God. He believed God and God accounted for righteousness. Now, God made a covenant with Abraham that through him, the seed of redemption would come to be. God made a covenant with Abraham. And his promise came because of Abraham's faith and not because of his works. Galatians 3.16 tells us that the law which came 430 years later cannot do away with this covenant which was set in place with Abraham through faith. So God made a covenant with Abraham. And Paul tells us later that the law did not nullify that covenant. It came along about 430 years later. We also know that the true children of God, of true children of Abraham are those who are by faith and not by law. So you and I, if we if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are children of Abraham. We've been grafted in. Paul uses that analogy. We've been grafted in. We are Jews, guys. Did you know that? You're a Jew. Okay? So don't be anti-Semitic. Pray for Jerusalem. Okay, we'll go there. Getting off subject. Uh, Paul tells us that we who accept Christ by faith are all sons and daughters of Abraham, therefore part of the covenant of Abraham, which is the new covenant. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Abraham did, he did by faith. By faith he left his home in Ur, not knowing where he would go. By faith he lived in the land with his sons and his grandsons. By faith he received the son through Sarah. By faith he offered up Isaac. So we know that when he paid his tithes to Melchizedek, in Genesis chapter 14, he did it by faith. Because Abraham did everything by faith. He even complained by faith. David did it. David complained to God. So when you complain to God, do it by faith. Believe that God's hearing you and he's going to take care of it. Okay? All right. That's off the subject too. All right. So <clears throat> tithing is a faith thing. Uh, sure. They had to do it under the law, but God was showing us that He expects us to do, uh, even though faith, uh, even through faith, to give Him the first fruits of our income, and expect and expect Him to bless the rest far beyond what the whole could do. So tithing is not really under the law because it came before the law by faith through Abraham. Tithing is a faith thing. It smacks the devil in the face and it, face and it says. I trust God more than I trust this money I have. That's what tithing does. Tithing says, I trust God more than my income, more than my money. God's going to bless me. Now, what did Jesus say about tithing? In Matthew 22, 20, 23, 23, 23, Jesus was chastening the Pharisees. He said, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you tithe the mint, anise, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done, the tithing, okay, without leaving the others undone. So Jesus told us that we should tithe. We should tithe, but we need to also do justice and mercy. Now tithing is the first fruit. In Exodus 13, 12, it says, Consecrate to me the firstborn of whatever opens the womb, among the children of Israel, both man and of beast, it is mine. He also tells us in Exodus 23, 19, the first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. It is repeated in, and again in Exodus 34, 26. Leviticus 2, 12. As for the offering of first fruits, you shall offer them to the Lord. And we find this again in, repeated in Deuteronomy. And I've discovered that if God repeats something, it's probably something we should pay attention to. If he says it more than once. I mean, if he says it once, we ought to pay attention to it. But he knows us. He knows we're hard-headed. So he says it twice sometimes. So here we see the first fruit belongs to the Lord. That is why God told Israel in Malachi 3, 8 that they were robbing him when they didn't tithe. You're robbing God because that first fruit belongs to him. Now, this is not really a law thing. It's a basic principle of God. Okay? Understand that. Romans eleven sixteen says, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump also holy. 
And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Now that word holy means sac- sanctified. It means sacri- sacred, set apart unto God. To consecrate means to make or declare to be sac- sacred by certain ceremonies and rites. To appropriate, to set apart for use. To set apart, dedicate, devote to the service of God. Okay? So, what is the first fruit? The first portion off the top before anything else. That's the first fruit. Right off the top before anything else. So when we take the first fruit portion of our earning, our paycheck, we are ceremonially consecrating it to the Lord. It becomes holy. It is set apart for the service and worship of God. So we take that first fruit and we set it aside and we consecrate it as holy. But here's what the Word of God says. If the first fruit be holy, the whole lump is holy. So when you get your paycheck, okay, let's say your paycheck's $500 a day. All right. All right, so you take that. What is that, $500 a day times five? That's uh, 25, 2500 a week. All right. So you've got that $2,500. That ain't, that ain't holy. That $2,500 is not holy. Okay? But then when you take that tithe, you take that $250 and you bring it to church and you put it in the offering. The rest of that is all holy. Now think about this for a minute. What can you buy with holy money? You buy the good stuff. You get the good stuff. You get the, you don't get the stuff that breaks down. You don't get the stuff that goes bad. You get the good stuff because, and you can expect that. When I go buy something, I always think about it. Now, Lord, I'm buying this with money that's been consecrated. It's holy. I don't expect this thing to break down. And it doesn't usually break down. I told somebody one time, I said, you know, we all tithe. Everybody in the world tithes. Did you know that? Everybody does. Some to the repairmen. Some to God. Okay, but everybody pays tithes. Think about it for a minute. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, Now is Christ risen from the dead and became the first fruits of them that slept. In 1 Corinthians 15, 23, But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. Jesus is the first fruit, the tithe that consecrates us and sets us apart and makes us holy. If Jesus is the first fruit that makes us holy. How much more does our tithe make what we have left holy? And I can guarantee you from experience, from I started tithing, my parents tithe, they taught me to tithe. I can tell you right now that 90% will go farther than the 100. It will every time. I remember when I didn't have a job, we still had food, we still had a house, we still had a car, now, sometimes God takes things away from people. Okay, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm better than anybody else. God, does. But God is always faithful. Okay? God is faithful. So as you prepare your tithes and offerings, ushers come forward. We're going to receive the tithe first and then the offering. Okay, so if you'll prepare your tithe. standing everyone stand if you don't have your tithe the day you didn't get paid this week you don't have your tithe that's fine you stand because you're saying god i will consecrate my life my money to you all right come forward to give your tithe come on give your tithe bless the lord This is your tithe, folks, not your offerings, just your tithe. In the ash I am born again. Hallelujah. Forever safe in the Savior's hands. You are more than my words could say. I follow you, Lord, for all my days. Fix my eyes, follow in your ways. Forever free and unending grace.
we're going to take up the offering. Now listen, this is the overflow, the abundance, the blessing. Brother Bill, Brother Bill, would you grab that one? Please? Today is also first Sunday, and that is what? Take the land. All right. Take the land. Folks, I told you this before, but I'm going to say it again. Don't get discouraged because we haven't built that sanctuary yet. Continue to make your commitment to God and to this church that you're going to do or take the land. Okay, so we're going to do both. The basket is for your offering. The treasure chest, this goes in legacy as well, is your take the land off. Okay, so get that ready and bring it forward. Tithe and your, your offerings and your take the land. Sometimes it's, it's not that I've got it all together and I'm jumping up and down and saying, wow, look at this. I have so much abundance. I'm doing it. I believe, oh, God, but help me. Amen. So I guess the important thing is just do it. And by faith. And then let God help us in our unbelief. Father, I thank you. And as we lay hands on this offering and the tithe, oh, God, I thank you that you are abundantly, that you give abundantly more than we could ask or think. So, Lord, we want to do big things this year, just big things. We want to do the things that, that are outside the ordinary. We want to be extraordinary in everything, and we want to be that way in our giving, too. So we offer to you, Lord, the, the small things, believing you for the big things. Trusting you, we dedicate this for the, for the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. I can be on top. Ooh, I can. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, praise God. Okay, well, I'm, I might be out of practice. <laughs> I'll tell you, I've been so blessed um, to be able to receive. And uh, Pastor Michael has done a phenomenal yes. job. He brought, and that's what's awesome about a team and the way it works in the body of Christ, is that he brought what I could not bring, and I am grateful that I don't have it all. I'm glad you don't have it all, and I'm glad we need each other, and that's the way this works, and I, am, I, I have been so blessed. I, I really do feel that God has been preparing us. I need to take an earring off then. <laughs> 
because that's what y'all will be listening to the whole time. Uh, Crystal, somebody, come get this earring off of me. <laughs> it's very cute, and it's done a certain way, and I, I bet, but let's let Crystal, <laughs> Crystal, my, uh, no, listen, y'all don't know. Brother Vic could probably do this fine. Thank you. Hallelujah. Yes, we do. You are right about that. And that reminds me of um, New Year's Eve. If you were here New Year's Eve, it was awesome to get to hear and see, and, uh, and, and I hope we'll, we'll be able to present a few of those things that happened on New Year's Eve. We had a group uh, that uh, got a song uh, called Epic. What's it called? They wrote the lyrics and everything. It was so awesome. And, uh, and I want you to be able to hear that. And so we'll probably do that a couple times. I think it's probably archived if you want to go back and, and look at it. I'm excited about this year. I, I really, um, I've sensed really since last September that there were just, just such a movement in the atmosphere. And um, I just want to reflect that movement in my own life, you know, not just, not just say, you know, well, it's a new year. It's more than that for me. Uh, the new year is always a great time to reflect on, on where you come from, where you're going. Great time. You can do that any time of the year. It doesn't have to be on the first Sunday in January. But it is a great time collectively for us to get through the holidays. You'll have good holidays. Yes. <laughs> I think it's the worst Christmas we've ever had. <laughs> we were all sick. It's terrible. I, it's a lot of sickness that's been going on. But you know, the, the thing about the holidays is that um, it, you look forward to it like all year long and then it gets here and then you kind of start looking forward to it being over and, uh, and, and what are we going to do next? Well, I I'm not sure. I can't give you the, everything that's going to happen in the world, but I can tell you this. God is raising a people who are fearless in their obedience to him Amen. and in the performance of his word. Amen. This is not playtime, in case you hadn't noticed. The world is in crisis. Our nation is in crisis. And while that is always true at somewhere in the world all the time, it does seem as though many things are coming together at once in a, a major crisis moment. And, and the prophetic voices of our day and those that I respect have a very guarded look at this season. They, they are speaking of what God is uh, doing, but our need to be prepared. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Amen? One of the ways that we can prepare ourselves is through fasting. And every year, I think I, think I said it was our 17th year, maybe 18th year, we, we, do, we, we collectively do the Daniel fast together every year. And um, that doesn't mean you have to, and nobody's going to be checking up on you to see if you did. But if you'd like to be a part of this time, we have for you a, a booklet that we'd love to. Are, are they ready to give out, or we give them out at the end? Yeah. We'll give them out at the end. This is Daniel Fast 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting. Now, what this has in it is uh, how to begin your Daniel Fast, how to prepare spiritually, how to prepare physically, those sorts of things. We've got menus and recipes recipes because there's, that's always the biggest thing. Uh, on a Daniel fast, and I'm going to talk about it in just a minute, uh, there are certain things that we do not eat and other things that we do. Uh, as well, this does contain a daily devotional. So we're praying together every day, no matter where we are, uh, the, uh, 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 on the same subjects and meditating on the same scriptures every day. So you will have this. When you leave today, you can take this with you. Now, for the people who have done this before, I don't have to try to convince them because every time we uh, we do this, God just does such tremendous things in us personally. If you've never fasted before, I want to encourage you to go ahead and take a swing at it. 
Uh, don't be afraid. Go ahead and try. You might be very surprised at the grace of God that will come upon your life in order for you to do this. This is really about a consecration, uh, setting apart something to the Lord. And so that's why we do it. Now, we're also going to be praying uh, at uh, different times and on different schedules. But this week, this week, there will be morning prayer in the prayer room from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. Some of us have never prayed for an hour or we've certainly never lost sleep to do it. But I'm going to really encourage you in your own personal walk. There's something about dedicating that time that will pay off for you in great ways. You won't even, you'll be wanting to do it every morning. And, and if you ever do, try so I know for some of you, this will be an adventure that you've never been a part of. We want you to be a part of it with us. Your leaders are all involved in doing this, and many of the people in this congregation uh, will be a part of it. Um, I'm welcoming as well. I realize we didn't mention Legacy Theater this morning, and we welcome you, and we want you to be a part as, a, as the body of Christ at Epic Church. Um, you know, the great thing is when we started doing this many years ago, very few people, we didn't hear about this very often. Now there's a lot of churches that are doing it. And, and I think it's kind of nice that maybe a lot of churches are fasting at the same time and praying. Who knows? God might do something. <laughs> if we would do that in, you know, in unity, wouldn't that be awesome to do? If you have questions, we'll be glad to talk to you about that. You can ask. It'll be on our website as well. And, and um, y you will not be alone. You'll have people that you can connect to. I want to read to you out of the book of Daniel, out of the first chapter. It's the story, but I'm going to read it this morning instead of just telling it to you. I want you to see it in the scripture. Daniel chapter 1, I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. The very first verse says this, During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. Now, I could stay there for a minute. None of us want to think that God is orchestrating the bad things of life. But can I tell you this morning that true trust only comes when we realize that God is still in control? even when it doesn't look like it. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylon, Babylon and placed them in the treasure house of his God. So you see what the picture is here, that Judah, Israel, has been overrun by an enemy and they have stolen things out of the temple and now taken it back to an ungodly temple. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. So are you getting the picture? These are the ones who were ruling and reigning. They were the ones living in the palace. They were the ones who are in, in, the, in the tents of the rich. These are the ones. They're the royal uh, lineage have now been taken into captivity and brought to Babylon. He said this in verse 4, select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning and gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own I mean, this is like a choice and plum assignment for someone who is in captivity. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. Now, it names the four names, the young men who were chosen, all from the tribe of Judah, the chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel is called Belshazzar, but we call him Daniel. But the next three we know as Shadrach, Meshach, 
and Abednego. Verse 8, but Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat those unacceptable foods. Now, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel, but he responded, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths of your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. And at the end of those 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of those 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. We talk about this Daniel fast and about what happened with Daniel, and I'm not sure. I want, the reason why I wanted to read it is I'm not sure that we remember all the details and exactly how it happened. It's interesting to me as you look at this story that you have Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were coming from a place of privilege. These were not just slaves somewhere. These were the ones who were educated. These were the ones who lived well. They were the ones who were well respected in their, uh, in, in their tribes. And, and, and these are the ones that were brought into the house of the king. They were already good looking. They were, listen, he brought the best of the best. And I thought about that of how it must have seemed because he says that in the end he found out that they were 10 times more smarter, 10 times more gifted. And I realized that there had to be at least 10 tests. At least 10 tests that were done to compare them with the magicians and the enchanters. How would he know they were 10 times more if they didn't do it 10 times better? So that means that even after they stayed true to themselves and didn't eat the king's dainties and all of those things, that even presented... These who had, were of royal blood, who are being presented to be slaves in the house of the king, which is better than being a slave out in the field. Uh, they're being brought, and, and even though they looked better, they acted better, they still got tested at least 10 times. So I don't know if there was 100 times and 10 of the times they were better than the other. I don't know how they got it, but I know 10 times that they were able to interpret, understand, and literally the king realized that all of his magicians and understand that in their culture there were a lot of magicians, there were a lot of enchanters. They were, they, they, in Babylon they filled uh, the... Uh, <coughs> uh, they filled the palaces. This was a huge thing. This was their religion. And ten times more... These guys performed better than all of these enchanters and all of these magicians. Now, that is a pretty amazing thing. And I, I, I put myself in Daniel's place. And I began to realize that the kind of courage that it took 
for them to gain this victory is the kind of courage it will take for us to walk fearlessly, and I believe this is the word of the Lord for us this year, to walk fearlessly before God and man. You, <clears throat> you know, they knew who they were. And this is what I know. If you want to be fearless, if you want to walk fearlessly, you, you got to do just what they did, which is not forsaking who they really were because of a past failure. Think about what this must have felt like. They were in the royal family. They have been overrun. Their temple, the thing that they love, the temple of God, has now been uh, pillaged. And they are now in a Babylonian uh, a slavery. And they've been taken from the highest to what we'd probably consider to be the lowest. And, and they've been living their lives as though this would never happen. And yet, here they are, and I don't know about you, but it was probably disappointing to think that I, all my life I've been prepared to rule and reign. I'm a part of this royal family, and I am now in slavery and in the things of God that I was called to, to keep holy and, to, and all of that, everything, everything I was trained for. It's gone. And now they find themselves in the service of a king who is an abomination before God. I don't know exactly what I would have done, but I know what Daniel did. Daniel influenced some people around him, and he said, you know what, I'm not going to forget who I am just because I've had a failure in my life. He didn't let it go when it came time to take a stand. He did not let what was the should have been's of life. I, I should have been sitting on a throne. I should be the one ruling. I, I, I should have been with my family. I should have married the girl that I was destined to marry. I, I shouldn't be in this prison. I shouldn't be in this palace. I, I, I shouldn't be in a place where they're kneeling and bowing to other gods. That's not who I am. That's not how I was raised. That's not what I was supposed to be. This isn't what I was supposed to do. And in that moment, he had to make a decision. Decision. He could either allow what was should have been to become the place of his own discouragement and disappointment so much so that he was paralyzed and could not move or he decided to just go ahead and be who he was in the midst of it and just go ahead and continue and not allow that past thing to start to define him. Amen. It is good because it's a good, if, you, if we can understand this, if I went one by one and asked you, most of you right now have a picture in your mind right now. You're thinking of something that didn't happen the way it should have. You're thinking of the things that didn't happen that should have. You can remember when your faith was at a certain level and it just seemed like nothing could touch you and then you got that sucker punch. You can remember. And our memories of those things become the tomb that we die in because we can't see ourselves as who we are. Now we're defined. I have a picture up there. Can you get to that, Keith? It's that second picture. I want you to see this. I, I, uh, can you all read that? Somebody read it out loud to me. I can't see it from here.
We cannot live our dreams because we are living our fears. <clears throat> it's sort of like what Ken, rather Ken said this morning, everybody tithes. It just depends on where you tithe to. Everybody lives by some code or we live, we're, we're, we have rules in our lives. We have influence. Everybody's going to live. We live certain ways. We just have to choose how we live. And the truth is for many of us, we have now moved into what we hope is the safest place that we've ever been in because it begins to be our goal is to be safe rather than to be fearless. Our goal is to avoid surprises. You know, in this, in this house on Friday night, you see the flowers that are here, and they're beautiful flowers. And we had a family that was a part of Epic Church in the very beginning um, and sang on our worship team. And before that, they were with Shirley Arnold Ministries and traveled with us. And uh, this family we love very much. And um, their 12-year-old daughter was accidentally killed last Sunday, last Sunday night. And um, we hosted the um, memorial service. Yesterday morning, we hosted a memorial service, or we're a, a part of one for a man named Bob Good. You all won't know him. The Goods have been a part of the church for many years, and Bob was 80 years old. And uh, it was a beautiful service where we could, we could rejoice and talk about all the great memories and all the great things, you know. But on Friday night, it's a different story. I, I thank God for his grace and his peace and all of those things. And, you know, we, we just uh, are brokenhearted over this loss for this family. But when you look at these things, you begin to think, first of all, thank God that Bob lived 80 years had a wonderful life and children and grandchildren. It was wonderful to celebrate. But, but how do you celebrate at 12 years? That doesn't seem like enough time. It doesn't seem right. It's not like what it should have been, right? I thought a lot about this over the week because it's very difficult when you're going to preside over something like that. And I, I was amazed at the peace of God that was upon the lives of this family. If you got the, had the privilege of being here, you were ministered to before you left. It was beautiful. But I was thinking about this all week, about living fearlessly. Here's the reality. Guys, Just get you just might as well, if I was going to get a tattoo, maybe this is the one I should get. There are no guarantees. Faith isn't the guarantee that nothing bad is going to happen. True faith is not about the absence of conflict and, and, and the things of this world. It's not. I look back over 2014 and I, I can look around me in this room. And some of you had some disappointing moments where things didn't happen the way they should. What are we going to do with that? Are we, are we going to try to live safe? Because, listen, he, here are these, here's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let's face it. It's bad enough. <coughs> Excuse me. It's bad enough that they have been taken out of, <laughs> out of their royal position, and now they are under captivity. That's bad enough. You know, I mean, it, it is. But they at least are in the courts of the king, right? The truth is they had to make a decision about how they were going to live. Because you might think that they could have thought, well, at least we're in a palace. So let's kind of keep our mouth shut. Just do what they tell us to do. I mean, this is better than it could have been. 
and they could have done exactly what they were told to do and said, well, you know, as bad as it was, at least we don't have to worry about, we can still, you know, we have a bed, we have food, we, we've got that. So we can settle for that. I mean, you could do that because when you go through something difficult, there's something inside of our humanity that says, how can I control the rest of my life so that nothing like this will ever happen to me again? And so I can keep these things at arm's length. So how can I live safely? The problem with that is that when you decide to make safety your goal, you will miss God because God is in the details of all kinds of adventure, the unknown. I mean, faith by its very nature has to always step beyond what you know. Yes. 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 There are no guarantees. Don't be surprised. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like pain, so I probably won't do it. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, there are no guarantees. And you know the reason why you can go, oh, like Pastor Michael said, is because you can let go. <laughs> you can't guarantee safety. You cannot guarantee safety. That 12-year-old little girl went out and got in a hammock with a book to read, and the tree fell on her. No guarantees. I'm not saying this to make you feel bad. I'm saying this, that fear does not protect you. You can do it all right. You can do everything you think is right, and you still will deal with something that's going to come against you. Fear is not the answer. And it does come to that, trust. You don't really know if you trust God until you have to. (laughs) I hear people say all the time, I trust God with everything. And I'm thinking, well, when everything is gone, Uh then tell me you trust God. Now, I know there's some people in this room saying, wasn't this supposed to be an encouraging message this morning? (laughs) I don't know that I feel encouraged. (laughs) What I'm encouraging you this morning is to understand that just like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who could have settled for safety, made a decision that they would be who they were regardless of their past, regardless of their very recent failure, they made a decision that they They would not come under that or be defined by it. And they wouldn't live out their fear, but they would live out their faith. And that's where we must live. Nothing's guaranteed. Except this. God is in control. God knows the end from the beginning. My times are in his hands. I stand steadfast, trusting in the Lord. My heart belongs to him. That's in the natural, that's in the spiritual. Belongs to him. I can't start this thing and, and go overboard and try to swim away. I'm in the boat, guys. I'm here. I I said yes to God. And when I said yes to God, I didn't know all I was saying yes to. I found that out through the years. That's what happens. He doesn't tell you everything. But I'm constantly facing this myself, which is how much more can I trust you? How much more can I yield to you? How much more can I give up to you? 
Nick Walenda, you may have heard of him, the Flying Walendas. They're the ones who would go across the high wire. Their claim to fame, because they were circus performers since the 1700s, the whole Walenda family and their claim to fame is that all that they did, they did without safety nets. It says Nick, Nick uh, Walenda was born in Sarasota, Florida on January 24, 1979 to Delilah Walenda and Terry Troffer. At age two, his parents brought him, bought him a swing set. Before Troffer uh, had even finished assembling it, Walenda climbed up to the crossbar, crossbar and did a somersault. And he did it perfectly, Troffer recalls. I didn't teach him that. Around the same time, he began performing with his family in their circus act. While in his first public performance, dressed as a clown, was at SeaWorld San Diego in 1981. He began to play on the wire uh, at age two, walking back and forth while holding his mother's hand. At age four, he started walking the wire on his own, learning primarily from his father. As a child, he would play on his parents' practice wire with his older sister, Lehana, just two feet off the ground. Well, Linda's parents would throw objects at him as he practiced and even shot him with a BB gun. <laughs> to train him how to deal with distractions. At age six, he first visited Niagara Falls and immediately decided that one day he wanted to walk a tightrope across it. He spent most of his youth on the road living in a mobile home as his parents performed across America. I think I got shot. Anybody else had a BB? <laughs> Can you imagine? Here's this kid at two years old. He's already doing somersaults. It's just in his blood. And now he starts to practice, you know, first with his mother. So he's got that training, the mother's training. Then with his father, he's got training. Then with his sister, two feet off the ground, he's going along. And then he's, then he's on his own. And now, I mean, he's had a lot of training. And now he's walking on his own. And here are the people who helped him. <laughs> Shooting him with a BB gun. Why? Because they know one day he's going to be standing on a wire without a net that's so far up that if he falls, he will die. And they want to make sure that when he's just two feet off the ground, that the BB isn't going to keep him from making it when he gets up there on that wire. Oh, my goodness, you would call that love? Yes. It doesn't feel like love. It does, it's not warm and fuzzy. And I feel like I've had a few pot shots taken at me. I know about you, but I, I feel like I got shot. What do you do with that? What do you do? It comes, why? To learn how. To, to live this life without the safety net in place. <laughs> as long as the safety net is there, I will never fully give myself to what I'm doing because I always know that if I don't make it, I can always fall and something will catch me so I don't ever fully commit myself to this thing because I've got a safety net. When Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they came and said, we don't want to, we don't want to do that, the safety net got taken away. Because they had 10 days, 10 days in which they were going to be represented to the king. The king was going to look at them and see what had happened in these 10 days that they stepped out on the high wire for. And the only thing that waited for them was success or failure. It wasn't partial. They weren't partially successful. They were either going to make it or they were going to have their heads taken off. I mean, that's the way it was. 
if they didn't if they didn't qualify if the training that had been done was not enough in that moment a decision would be made and they would either continue on in victory and or, or they would be dead there was no way out what i'm saying to you is this faith requires something of us that stops trying to figure the way out right. and decides to make it through. All right. All right. Yeah. Fearless in 2015. <laughs> Where's that other picture? I have one more. Somebody read it out loud. You cannot forsake who you are because of your past failure. You cannot continue to be stuck in the what should have been. And there has to be that commitment to live without the safety net. That means you have to trust the preparation. And you have to allow every moment and everything we have to allow, everything we go through to be our training for the moments when we need to influence a nation, when we need to be the ones, when our name gets called. Daniel probably would have lived his life in some royal obscurity had he not been brought into the king's palace. Instead of living in obscurity, he became a leader, a ruler, influenced a nation, Changed the lives of all because he said, you know what? I'm going to eat vegetables and drink water. When we talk about the Daniel fast and we do it for 21 days, that's not really what he was required to do there. We just do it for 21 days, kind of representing when he prayed and it took 21 days for the angel to come and bring him the answer. But when we do this, we must do this with this idea. We're going to be... We're, we're going to take back who we are and stop reflecting the failures of life and the things that should have been, could have been, would have been and, and begin to live. This is the moment to wipe the slate clean. Right. I'm 62 years old. I've got 62 years of history that I could get stuck in and trust me, I could. Amen. This is a struggle for me. And I'm saying to you that the only thing I have left is to believe that there is a future and a hope for my life. That I am not defined by those failures, the should have been and would have been, all that. I'm no longer, I can't walk in that. I can't try to explain to you what should have been. I can only live in this moment and I'm on the tight wire again. I have to trust him with my health. Yeah. Makes me mad. Amen. I don't want to be that person. You didn't want to be that person that had to believe what you're having to believe for. I didn't want to be this person. I didn't want to have to think about my health. But I have to trust God. I don't trust the doctors. Nothing wrong with doctors. Thank God for doctors. But, <laughs> honey, you can go to three doctors and you'll have three different things. You have to pick which doctor you're going to listen to because they also, right? Amen. Thank God for doctors. But at the end of the day, I'm on the high wire. I don't have a safety net here. I have to live this. And I have to be the person I am. And part of who I am right now, who I have become, is the person who will trust God with my heart, with my life. You understand that? And the person you have become is the one who will trust God 
with your marriage, with your children, with the things that you have been disappointed about. You now become, you stop eating the king's dainties. You are not that. Who you are is one who comes from the royal household. And it doesn't matter what your prison may look like. And it doesn't matter what your palace looks like. You've still got to be who you are and let go of all the things that have tried to define you and be who you are. I want to live while I am alive, I can only do that by throwing it all on the line. Amen. 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 Brother Lenny sang a song the other night. It's my desire to live for Jesus. It's my desire. Come on, sing with me. To live for him. I too was once so lost. But I found my way to God. And it's my desire. brought me from and where I am today. You would know the reason why I love him so. You can take this world's wealth and riches. I don't need a thing. It's my desire, it's my desire, it's my desire to live for Him. Amen. Stand to your feet if you will. Hallelujah. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all. My eyes are on you, and it is well with me. This morning, there's some of you who need to make that declaration in a real way. You need to walk out of some of the old stuff that's had you stuck and just walk out and say, you know what? I'm ready. I'm ready for... I don't need the safety net. I, I, I'm ready. I'm ready to go for it and trust God. And trust the preparation and even the BBs of life <laughs> that I realize now were teaching me how to avoid the distractions. If that's you, I want you to just come to the altar and I want to pray with you. Pastor Michael, come. Pastor Ray, Pastor Glenn. Pastor Loretta. Yeah, Pastor Steph. Sing the part that says, so be what my soul and trust in him. This is, this is my prayer this morning. Can y'all give me about three more minutes here? this morning so let go so let go my soul and trust in him the winds and waves still know his name so let go so let go my soul and trust in him the winds and waves still
Spirit of the living God, I thank you that you are greater than all our problems and greater than all our fears. Today, Lord, we realize that, <laughs> oh, we were trusting in a false safety net. We thought we could control it. We thought we could save ourselves. But <clears throat> today, Lord, we acknowledge that there are no guarantees, but there is one thing we can depend on, and that is that you are faithful even when we are not, that we can trust you in all things. You're the great redeemer. Oh, I thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for strengthening our souls that we can stand strong and be of good courage that just like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we can be who we are. It doesn't matter what's happening around us, that we can rise up and be who we are in the midst of it. If you'd like to stay with us and, and worship and, and pray, and just we'd love for you to stay. Today's the day. Uh, today's the day. If you want to make that decision to be a part of this fast, we want you to be. Not because if we don't get any crowns and you know any stars in our crown because you do it, but because we want you to come through 21 days of fearless and bold obedience and let you see how it changes your life. But if you, if you feel you can't do that, there's all kinds of ways you can join in the fast. Some people fast media. They fast other things. That's fine. Do something to consecrate yourself to God during these next 21 days. I'm very excited about what God is going to do in your life and in the life of this church as a result. So today we bless you in Jesus' name. Happy New Year. This is a new year, a new moment. Slate wiped clean. Let's go forth. Let's be fearless in 2015. God bless you as you go. And, and I'll dismiss you now. We love you. Go out and change somebody's life. And we'll stay here. And if you want to, you're free to. So God bless you as you go.